G'day, I'm Daniel Camilleri. This is Laura McKillop, and uh, we bring you Dog Talk. And today um, we've got the president of the New South Wales Yard Dog Association, Nathan Cave, with us. G'day, Nathan. How are you going? Good, Dan. Good, Laura. How's it going? Good. Very well, thank you. Well, thank you. So to give um, to give our listeners out there a bit of an idea of what we're going to do here, um, we've got a list of questions we're going to ask Nathan. But feel free to um, send a message in if you want, and Laura can ask questions to Nathan as we go. Um, if we get flooded, obviously we might not get to all of them, but we'll get to what we can. We don't want to take up your whole night either. So, um, Nathan, thanks for giving us um, your time, mate. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from? Um, originally from Sydney, uh, moved out of Sydney sort of in my early 20s. Um, we live in a small town just outside of Cowra called Kurawatha. Um, I manage a, a trade lamb enterprise. So we've got a 4,000 head uh, lamb feedlot. Um, we, we, we target mainly the domestic market. Um, and we look to probably trade somewhere between 20, 25,000 lambs a year. Um, we, we've, we've just actually gone into purchasing some breeding ewes, so that probably adds another dynamic to the, to the property. Um, and yeah, that probably covers pretty much where we are and what we do here. You've mentioned we a few times there, Nathan. Um, you've got a few, few people there helping you out. Oh, I've got two on full time. Uh, I get a, a couple of casual guys uh, in to help sort of when we need it. Uh, probably October through to March is probably our busiest period. Um, October sort of starts with, you know, lambs coming in, processing lambs and whatnot. And I guess from, from there on, it's, it's more, um, in, you know, induction into the feedlot, uh, weighing lambs, sort of getting them ready to go out the gate. So, um, yeah, really busy period for six months. And then it sort of seems to, you know, tapers off a little bit, just sort of heading into autumn. Yep, yep. I mean, how do your dogs make your day-to-day -day life much easier and why? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I guess, you know, 20,000, uh, you know, 20,000 lambs, that's a, that's, a, that's a lot of sheep. <laughs> and uh, we don't, it, look, it's not, a, it's not a big property. Um, you know, we're probably close to sort of 4,000 acres, um, very flat, sort of down where we are. Um, and I guess we run reasonably big mobs. Um, you know, I think, a, a, you know, a lot of you would sort of realise that um, obviously working lambs, predominantly lambs, that's a different dynamic to sort of older sheep or ewes and lambs and whatnot. So, um, for me, tend to sort of need a bit of a specialised dog uh, for that. Um, the yard works generally pretty good. Getting them sort of in from the paddocks can be a bit of a challenge because we tend to get the lambs, um, you know, brought to us, weaned straight off mum, um, so you can sort of imagine what they're like, you know, when they get here. So it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of education of the stock, um, but after a while they you know, they sort of understand the routine and whatnot. And I think the dogs play a very big role sort of in the education of the lambs. And look, I guess I heard the other day, um, actually on the radio, they were talking about drones potentially sort of coming in and taking over a lot of that sort of mustering uh, type work. And mm -hmm. I just knowing the, the layout of our farm here and whatnot, I mean, uh, and and how difficult it can be. You know, we might have a we might have a paddock of, you know, fifteen hundred to two thousand lambs. Um, you know, that can be a real challenge. So you certainly need you know good dogs and um, you know to sort of get through day by day. I I just I couldn't see any other alternative to be honest. And you mentioned twenty thousand sheep. Um, you're not going to go hungry today during lockdown, are you? <laughs> no, no, we're covered with lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, we're all, we're all good there, and that's look. That's um, I think that's probably one of the rewarding things too is you know to, to sort of put that that effort in, that hard work in, and to be able to 
you know, provide for your family at the end of the day with a product that you've helped get to the table, that's pretty rewarding. That would be pretty satisfying. Yep. And you spoke there about your dogs a bit, mate. Um, how does the work you do actually influence the style of <clears> dogs um, that you need and um, and, far, like, and the type of dog that you from where you'd normally prefer? Or how, how have you drifted? Look, I guess my dogs have evolved um, quite a lot sort of over the years from where I started to where I'm at now. And I guess, um, look, there's no doubt that your environment um, dictates what type of dog sort of suits you. Um, you know, you could, you, could, you could run a dipping business and, um, you know, have that contracting side of, of work and, you know, you're probably going to target a particular type of dog to get you through the day. I guess here uh, I tend to find that I prefer a better outside dog um, or one that can really think for himself outside. Um, we do a lot of mustering um, and, yeah, I tend to find that um, our biggest challenge, if anything, is actually getting stock into the yards at times. Um, but then in saying that, you know, we do do a massive amount of yard work. Um, but I tend to find that uh, probably that over-the-top type dog that works in the yard with a lot of lot of bark and a lot of push and a little bit busier probably doesn't really suit uh, what we do. Um, it tends to sort of work and have a negative aspect on, on our lambs. It's and funny so you say it, that, Nate. Sorry to cut you off. When I right. first got into yard trialling, um, a particular gentleman from around your area, very um, wealth of knowledge, and he said to me, uh, he pulled me aside at a trial once, he said, Dan, all you need for this yard dog stuff is a paddock dog that can back and bark and knows where to be. And that's something I, I think about all the time. And it's funny, like you were talking about how important your, your paddock work is, but you don't want that full-on yard dog. So that kind of suits exactly what you're looking for. Yeah, look, I think so. What I, I sort of tend to ex describe it to people. I mean, my dogs can, can back um, and, and they bark and they work the yard, you know, effectively. Like they're... They they certainly aren't afraid to be in the yard and and whatnot. But I tend to find I'm probably choosing or selecting dogs now more on how they position themselves in the yard and the effect that they can have on sheep. Um, you know, sort of to get the desired outcome. Um, and so my yeah my dog certainly wouldn't be described as a as as a yardy type dog. Um, I guess it's sort of striking that. That happy medium as best you can is is to get that outside ability and and that and that yard work and I think most people generally tend to sort of try and get that all rounder type dog um, and and it's probably fair to say that some of mine might lean you know more toward the yard and then some might sort of lean more toward paddock work um, but yeah, that's sort of what I try and target and I I just find that that's for me, day to day, that's probably the most effective dog for me. Yeah, yeah. So you've obviously been the president of the New South Wales Yard Dog Association for twelve months now. How and why did you get involved with this um, with the association? Yeah, it looked probably about eight months, January. Um, but uh, look, I guess, uh, I guess. Look, the association really means a lot to me. Um, not, you know, not in the terms of, you know, that it's my life and I live and breathe yard dogs and whatnot. But w when I think what the association's given me and I, I guess where I've sort of come to now and the influences that the association's had, it probably, it probably, I find myself sort of wanting to give back to it. Um, yeah. And I guess... Look, I started off trialling, um, you know, running a few trials, like especially when I was sort of in the Boorowa area, um, you know, I was running a few trials. And I guess that was that was a way of um, sort of giving back a little bit. And um, it's, it's, you know, it is rewarding to, to put a trial together and, you know, have your mates and have, have members come and sort of participate and see the day, you know, go well and them enjoy themselves. And I guess... Look, I didn't go into um, the president's role um, 
with with anything specific to achieve. I'd never actually been on the committee before, so it's all very new to me. And um, I'm certainly not a political type person. Um, so I guess it was really just um, being able to give back. Um, I thought I had something to, you know, worthwhile to contribute. Um, you know, our, our president of three years, he was stepping aside. And I spoke to a couple of um, couple of the lads that were, you know, had been on the committee and we just sort of put the idea around and here we find ourselves <laughs> being the president of the association. <laughs> but, well, but I haven't yeah. heard anyone complain yet, mate, so um, you're doing a good job by all accounts and well, we witness it firsthand. So yeah. mate, uh, hats off to you, mate. It can't be an easy job, especially in times like these when, you know, you're making hard decisions to cancel trials Some sometimes at you know, pretty much last minute or cancel ahead of, you know, trials have still got a bit to go, but just for safety of the community and, you know, it's it's not an easy thing to do. No, look, it's, um, you know, it was a baptism of fire, you know, the first probably two or three months. Um, I think we've found our feet a little bit now. Um, look, COVID hasn't made it any easier. Um, but look, I've got great support throughout the committee. Um, we did, yeah, our aim initially was to keep trials running as long as we could, um, yeah. because I think it's important, you know, it, it is important that um, we continue to provide that outlet, especially for guys, you know, they, they do a lot of work through the week on farm and whatnot. And I think, I think the trials, sort of provide a little bit of a getaway for them, um, somewhere where they can, you know, they come and they converse and there's like-minded people and, and whatnot. And so I, I guess our aim to a certain point was to keep the trials up and running. But look, there just, there came a point where we felt like it was getting harder to manage. And so I guess, I guess, um, you know, we just needed to do the right thing by our members. We needed to do the right thing by the community um, or, their, or their communities. And what we had a committee meeting. Um, we didn't, you know, we didn't take it lightly. Um, the decision to, you know, to cancel trials just, you know, for the immediate future. But look, I think I'm glad we made a decision. Um, and, you know, I think you know, where we find ourselves now being, you know, in a state wide lockdown, we, we were probably, um, you know, pretty much on the right track with it. So, yeah, yeah look, hard decisions to make, but, um, you know, this won't continue forever and, you know, we'll, we'll just get back to doing what we can um, when we get the chance. Yeah, and, and you touched there on, um, you know, about guys being on farms or guys and girls being on farms and a bit isolated and whatnot at the time and, you know, it's, it's something that's pretty, we've spoken about before, it's pretty personal to me, you know, um, the year I've had having, you know, that camaraderie around that friendship because, you know, it's, it's pretty important to have your mates around you um, at times of need and when you're a bit quiet and things aren't happening a lot or you feel a bit isolated, <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Yeah, look, and I think that's the thing about the association. I mean, you know, there's the inevitable that you provide, you know, an opportunity for people to come and, you know, compete in a trial and run their dogs and whatnot. But the association probably goes so much further than that. Um, it's more than seven minutes out there, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's right. And, and look, I can speak from you know, personal experience, as I'm sure most of us can. But, I mean, the friendships that you develop, um, you know, through the association and going to dog trials, and I know in, in certain cases, um, like, they're, they're, you know, they're forever friendships. And, um, and, and, you know, like you mentioned, you know, people can find themselves, you know, going through a little bit of a rough patch and, to hear that they get support from other members that makes a difference, uh, you know, that that's probably really what it's all about. And, um, you know, I think that's that's just one thing, you know, I guess for those that, 
perhaps might be thinking of whether it's worthwhile or not. Um, you know, I think that in itself, there's just a lot more to gain from it than, you know, simply just turning up to a dog trial. Well, mate, you've answered my next question there, and that's mm -hmm. what does the New South Wales provide, um, the New South Wales Yard Dog Association provide its members? I, I think you've wrapped that up pretty uh, pretty good there. So let's get back mm -hmm. onto a, a lighter note. What's your favourite trial and, and why? Um, my favourite trial, I, I probably, look, they used to run a trial down at Jindabyne in an indoor sort of horse arena. I've got to say that was probably my favourite that I've been to, but that doesn't, that, that doesn't go um, any longer, unfortunately. But, yeah, look, there's probably, I'd have to say any trial down in the Monero is probably my favourite to go to, and that's probably, that, that, that would be, I, I love visiting the area, but I think uh, the, you know, the, the trial organisers down in the Monero do, you know, an exceptional job putting trials together and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, there's probably a couple of reasons why. Um, and, you know, obviously that's not to say that I don't enjoy, you know, going to other trials. I think Peter Armstrong at Oberon, he does a terrific job um, up there with Ian Rudder. Um, you know, th that trial's only getting better and better. Uh, so, you know, I like going to that one. Um, yeah, but you know, at the moment, there's probably no specific one one trial. I'm, I, yeah, I'm just I'm probably lucky to to make the, um, you know, most of the trials I'm getting to at the moment. But um, look, just uh, and I'll just just to go back to your other question, just about you know what what the association offers members. Look, just just another thing too, um, which I think is important to get out there. I think what the association offers in terms of um, dog trialling, handling dogs, stockmanship and whatnot is is just another, like it, it's a standard of, of how to go about doing that. Um, and that's not to suggest that there aren't other stockmen that have standards with their dogs and how they, and, and how they work stock and whatnot. But I think you know, for a lot of the young people coming into the industry, um, and if you think of the, you know, the knowledge and the experience that's around a lot of the handlers that are trialling, um, you know, seeing them handle dogs, seeing good dogs work, and I think you take that with you to your everyday job. Yeah. Um, I, I know for me that was certainly the case, um, and. Yeah, it's just it's it's working to a standard, and I think that benefits you um, day to day with the way that you handle stock, with the way that you probably in turn handle and train your dogs. Um, so I, yeah, I just wanted to make that point because I think that's um, you know that's probably one of the the most important thing, especially for people coming into the um, like the agricultural industry. So on that note, we've just had a question from Dave Motley asking, how do we promote best practices around stock handling, including um, yard do dogs, yard design, when we're going trialling and stuff? Look, I think yard designs very much, um, you know, changes from, you know, region to region and trial organisers and whatnot. I mean, I think sometimes you get trial organisers that are limited in resources and so that they can only really offer you, um, you know, what they have available. But look, I guess there's always um, two sides to it. I think that you want to display through the association and, and through our trialling that we, you know, take care of our stock. Um, you know, I think that by way of design of yards and whatnot, um, you want to encourage stock to flow. I mean, that's what, you know, we're actually in the middle of building a new set of yards here at the moment. And, you know, our priority really is, um, you know, taking care of stock, stock flow, making everything easier. Um, and I think that's, I think that's important when it comes to trialling. Um, 
you know, I, I, there, there comes, you know, there's a, there's a big discussion between time limits that, that they put on trials. Um, you know, some have very sort of short six, seven minute type trials and others can sort of extend out to, you know, eight, nine minutes or, or longer. But I think we need to look at striking a balance where you're, you know, you're putting a time limit on, you've, you know, you've given thought towards your, your trial or yard design so that you can display the utmost in stockmanship um, and animal welfare. Um, and I think that's what you target when when you work at home. And, you know, just considering the fact that we put ourselves out, you know, in a in a public domain and we're, we're somewhat entertaining the public, but I think we've got a duty of care to sort of display that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to read that other question we got coming there? Um, we also had a question come in from Ryan Johnson. Um, if you had a dog that was shaping up all right and doing what you expected at the age and got your work, but you just didn't like the dog, would you persist and hope to build a bond or would you quit and allow it to go into a, a home where it is liked? Yeah, I, I think for me personally, um, you've got to want to get up in the morning wanting to see your dogs and wanting to spend the day with them. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't persist with a dog that perhaps I just didn't quite get along with because I just don't think that gels. Um, when you've got a connection with a dog, I believe that um, your approach and your dog's approach to the job um, is more effective. Um, and that bond that you create really means something. And I think that you'll find that when you need that dog the most, he'll go above and beyond to be there with you. And, you know, sometimes to the point where he's that tired, he's that worn out, that he's at least, you know, he's trying, he's giving you yeah. the effort. And I think you, your gut, I always go with my gut feeling. Um, I, I, I've learnt to trust my gut. And, yeah, for me, it never hurts to sell a bad dog. And if you can sell a dog on to a good home and it suits that person, I think that's just as rewarding as if you were keeping them yourself. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a you. I'm a I'm a real believer in um, liking and wanting to spend time with your team. Pretty hard to uh, spend a lot of time with a mate that you don't get along with, isn't it? <laughs> turn up yeah. and work with them every day. <laughs> like, you know, we uh, we spend a lot of time with each other over the last uh, couple of. Or a couple of months now, and yeah. um, if we didn't like each other, it'd be a bit hard to uh, rock up and. Uh, we'll have a brother and sister these days. And so work together. <laughs> yeah. so, you are, you yeah, no, no headlocks yet, so it's all it's all okay. <laughs> no, I get that. <laughs> um, I suppose um, oh, this is one of your ones there. Um, um, what's your fondest trialing memory? Sorry, I just stole Laura's question. <laughs> fondest trialing memory. Um, it'd have to be in New South Wales, wouldn't it? Yeah, look, I, I, I came second in a New South Wales with my original trial dog, um, Capri Dooley. Um, yeah, that would, and that was at that Jindabyne trial, actually. That was indoors, um, wasn't it, Nathan? That, yeah, that was indoors. Yeah. That, yeah, that's probably my fondest memory. Um, I mean, he's my ultimate dog. Um, He's by no means my, you know, my best dog, but he, you know, he's the dog that means the most to me. So probably a little bit of sentimental um, side to that, to that moment. Do you reckon that goes back, you, you made an interesting comment then, is sentimental. Do you reckon that goes back to what we were just talking about answering um, Ryan's question about being mates with your dog? Like... Look, there's, I guess with Dooley, there's a little bit of a history with it um, because he, you know, he really pulled me into, you know, working dogs and, and especially trialling. Um, you know, I, I started off, I was buying, you know, I, I had a couple of dogs that I was just sourcing from all over the place. And I actually had a friend that introduced me to Chris Stapleton. Yeah. Um, and we, he took me over to Chris's and at the time, um, Chris used to hold an, an on-farm ram and dog auction 
And look, I, I, I didn't really know anything about dogs, handling dogs, working dogs, and uh, but I was keen. Like I, I was keen to learn and went over to Chris's and um, I think, you know, Chris was doing a little bit of work at the time and I was I was pretty quiet and I was just watching him and, um, you know, it was something that I'd really never seen before and he was just doing day-to-day jobs um, in the yards at the time and um, obviously I, I sort of looked and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm seeing dogs do what I hadn't seen them do before and I thought that was pretty cool and anyway, Chris's auction was coming up and, um you know, and he had some some young dogs on offer, and um, I, I pretty much had my heart set on getting one of these dogs. And he had four on offer, um, and the one that I liked um, at the time, and the only reason I liked it was because it, it of its name, which was Ribbon, and it was <laughs> like, and, um, knew nothing about dogs and what I was looking at. But anyway, it went, and Chris actually he, he said to me he had a younger. Um, bitch there she was only maybe just over 12 months old and she'd actually just had a, a litter of pups and I don't know if it was a plan joining or not but um, yeah she only had a, a small litter of three and Chris actually said to me he said look he said if you if you buy this bitch I'll give you one of the pups and that was probably you know a little bit of incentive for me and um, so look I, I ended up buying Capri Rose and you know, after the sale, Chris took me up to his kennels and had the three pups there and he said, you know, pick your pup. And I, I don't know how I picked him. Um, I, I probably just picked the one that was the friendliest and sort of maybe came up to me and, and that turned out to be Dooley. And I remember saying to Chris when I first met him, I said, you know, I'm not interested in trialling or any of that. I just, you know, really I was just looking for a, a farm dog. Um I think I thought that maybe trialling and whatnot was well beyond me at the time. And but look, that that generosity from Chris um, has probably um, just sort of brought me to where I'm at with my love of working dogs and um, you know getting into trialling and whatnot. And um, you know, so that sentimental side with Dooley goes a lot lot deeper than just you know success at trials and whatnot um you know it was it was how I got introduced into it um you know I um I'll be forever grateful to Chris and I mean I admire Chris you know not just not just for you know his success with you know breeding and trialing um dogs but you know my, my story with his generosity is not the only one and um you know, I really look up to him for that. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I guess um, so that mateship that Dooley and I had um, or have, he's still alive, he's still going, but, um, <laughs> you know, that that's that, that means everything to me. And he he pretty much, look, he, he got me started. Um, we learnt together and I'm sure he could have been better than what he was, but... Look, I wouldn't have changed anything, and um, I think I, I probably, you know, my my dogs now are probably nothing like what they what Dooley was like, um, but there are traits that he had that you know I certainly want to see, you know, in my dogs definitely. Oh, fantastic, mate. We've got questions coming from everywhere at the moment, so <laughs> we'll do our best to try and get through them. But are no, you right? We've deviated a bit from what we had here to ask, but that, that's cool. Like, we're happy with that. That's what Dog Talk's all about. So, um, I'm going to put my glasses on to read this next one. Can you read that for Yeah, so we've actually had a question from Ollie Hansen, um, and it's who are your favourite handlers slash dogs to watch and why? And obviously Chris is a big major influence with you, so. Who, who would be the current ones, I suppose, yeah. um, Ollie might be asking? Uh, current one. Look, I... <laughs> I uh, look I guess I'll talk about a few people that have you know that have had a, you know influence on me um, and obviously I've mentioned Chris but um, Michael Johnston probably has had the most profound impact on me um, I came from a horse background and I used to uh, you know I used to train dogs or my approach to training dogs was similar to that of you know 
training horses. And um, my dogs were, you know, they were, they were obedient and, you know, had a lot of control on them and whatnot, but they were... Uh, they weren't natural, you know, they were a bit robotic. Um, and I didn't live far from Michael. Um, and look, I think just through trialling and the fact that we lived reasonably close and whatnot, and I've never been one to shy away from asking for help. And so, um, yeah, I started going over to Michael's. I, I, look, I probably would have been over there um, I would have been a nuisance, to be honest. Um, and you know, <laughs> making making you know phone calls and and going over there. And I think what he taught me was um, the importance of striking a balance. It's one thing to have control, but you need that dog to still be able to think for himself. And I've probably gone complete sort of one eighty in terms of that because I am less of a dog trainer now and I probably try and breed for specific traits that I want to see um, and you know I won't go out and teach a dog to cast um, I, I want to see him cast naturally and um, you know things like that um, and and look I'm not saying that Michael's pushed me you know totally to that point but he certainly had a profound effect on the on, on my approach to um, yeah, to working dogs, training dogs and whatnot. Um, and I think that's probably the foundation. And from there, um, like Ashley Corkill, he's, he's, you know, he doesn't trial a lot anymore, but, you know, he would be one of the best handlers that I've seen. And, and, it, and it's because, you know, he knows what he likes in a dog and, you know, he does that you know, that day to day, he knows what makes a good work dog. And um, look, he's probably, he had a dog called Maribo Roy, who is probably my ultimate dog in terms of a, of a, of, you know, of a dog that I've seen work wise, trial and whatnot. Um, he's probably my standard in terms We're of what, I, about Roy before. Oh, yeah, what I, what I try and target in terms of breeding, but um that dog, you know, and, and Ashley, Ash and I sort of talk um, often about about dogs and, and all sorts of things like that, but Ash isn't one of those that goes out and, and specifically trains a dog um, and, and Roy was just Roy. Roy, I think Ash would probably say that Roy taught him, you know, more than, than anything else in terms of working dogs and, um, you know, so guys like Ash... Um, I don't think, look, I, I like watching the older handlers, um, you know, Kevin Howes, Robert Cox's, Bill Luff's, you know, you just can't, you can't buy that knowledge and that experience. And, um, you know, I just like watching them work a dog. And there's a little bit of old school um, stuff in there. I sort of tend to lean more towards the their older school way of doing things. But you know, and, and, and I think there's, you know, there's younger guys coming through now. Um, Jake Nowland, for example, you know, I don't think you would find anyone that puts a better handle and a better finish on a dog than Jake. Um, you know, what I, what I love about what Jake does um, is he really tries to understand the, the ph philosophy of a dog and the way a dog thinks in his mind and Jake tries to get into his mind and get the most out of that dog that he can possibly get. And um, I always used to view Jake just from a trialing perspective. Um, you know, I'd see him at a trial and 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 obviously competing and whatnot. But I, I had I had Jake come out to give me a hand there for uh, a couple of months during our busy season. And um, and and that on the on the flip side, seeing him work and and work those dogs here at home. Um, probably gave me more of an appreciation for, you know, not 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 just J Jake's dogs, but you know his ability as a handler. Because I think I assumed that by watching him at a trial, he would, you know, his dogs might be a little bit robotic, but you know I saw those dogs work, um, you know, as naturally as as what you'd see, you know, a lot of other dogs, and um, you know, so just just opportunities like that. Um, 
you know, look, I just, I don't think it's really fair to sort of single particular handlers out because I think in New South Wales, we're probably blessed we're to have such young. a, oh, look, you know, I think across the spectrum, we probably have, you know, the best handlers and the best dogs. Um, that's not to suggest that there aren't those handlers and dogs in other states. But just I think when you quantity. turn up, yeah, quantity and, and just, um, you know, turn up to a trial, to an open trial or a championship trial and, you know, you could probably, yeah, you could probably easily count on two hands who could possibly take it out. And it's, um, I think the standard is very, very high. And I know for me, um, you know, those guys set that standard and I'm not particularly competitive. I mean, obviously I like to go out and do well and I like, you know, if I win, I love, I love to, to come away with the win. But for me, it's going to the trial and it's, you know, are my dogs up to that standard? And if my dogs can go out and work, um, you know, work to, a, to, to that standard where I guess that lets me know where I'm at. Um, in terms of where I'm heading with my dogs and my handling and whatnot. Um, I think in terms of dogs, I think probably the best trial dog I've ever seen was uh, Michael's Bonong Buster. Um, I just don't think I've seen... Uh, maybe Kevin's Abba might be close in terms of, you know, consistency and, and, and whatnot and the way they work to trial. Um, I think they're probably, I think Buster would certainly be a, a standout for me. Um, you know, Chris Stapleton's dogs, back when I first sort of started going, oh, look, he had a great team of dogs. Michael had a great team of dogs. Bill Luff, um, oh, look, there were, there were plenty, of, plenty of good handlers, plenty of good dogs. I think nowadays there probably doesn't seem to be a real standout one or two dogs at the moment. I think Matt Sherwood's wonder. Um, you know, he's probably always one of those dogs at the moment that, you know, if you, you've sort of got to turn up and beat him, he's always consistent. Matt does very well with him at, at trials. Um, but I think at the moment there's sort of more, you know, there's just a top echelon of dogs, more than just yeah. maybe two or three really standouts. And I'm not sure whether that's, the ability of the dogs or maybe just where we're getting to in terms of, um, you know, the way we're handling, training, competing at trials and whatnot. I'd like to think maybe it's because we as handlers are getting better and so you've just got a broader, you know, a, a wider range of good dogs. It's, it's actually, it's funny you say that. We've got a question here um, on, from Joe Spicer and it's, do you think trialling helps us breed better quality work dogs? Yeah, I think so. I think definitely it does. Because as I said before, it's the standard that you're working to. Um, and I think most of us know that um, I certainly don't take the way I work a trial and put that in my day-to-day -day work. Um, how I work at home is different to how I trial. And I guess I guess I was talking to Steve Wayman the other day and he made a he made a really interesting comment he said the difference between you know do dogs that don't trial and those that do is are probably the amount of control that they have on them yeah. um and look i think that's a pretty fair comment to make but look there are i certainly try and approach my job at home with a more practical mindset i mean i've you know you want to get on with the job you want to get through what you've got to do in the day and you just you're not there to train as such and you're not there to 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 strive for perfection i mean at a trial you're starting off with 100 points and you're trying to maintain those 100 points um but i think i think what trialing does is it shows you where your weaknesses are and it shows you not only probably your weaknesses as a handler but maybe your weaknesses in your dogs and especially when they're younger i think I get, I find watching the maiden and the novice classes a lot more enjoyable. Um, no, no, not more enjoyable, but I probably gain more out of it than watching the open dogs because when they're maiden and novice, they've they're got raw. ability, but they're raw. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and I guess that's when you're going to know maybe my dog's a little bit short on one side. I can't quite pull him pull him around and tuck the sheep in here. So I'll go home and I'll you know I'll work on you know a little bit of off balance work or you know if your dog is weak, I think uh, sooner or later it's going to get shown up at a trial. Um, if he lacks a little bit of walk-in, that's going to show up at a trial. If he lacks cover, it's going to show up at a trial. And um, and I think take that to the next level and you go to utility trialling where you, you know, sort of going out of the yard and, and you're sort of working in the paddock. Well, you take that to another level and maybe your dog, you know, maybe he can't cast, he doesn't work at a good enough distance, he can't rate his stock. And so I think that inevitably comes back to what traits you're then searching for and then what you want to then put into your breeding program. And that obviously comes back to the individual. I mean, what I like is not necessarily going to be what Joe likes. Um, but I think, again, and I keep coming back to it, but working to that standard is going to help you be, you know, become better. And, and hopefully, you know, my, my passion is breeding more so than, um, competing at trials um, and so I guess for me that really hits sort of home because um, I very much do focus on what I see at a trial from my perspective as then you know what I'll sort of then go and you know perhaps look to either change or add or maintain in in my dogs and um, and, and just I guess I'll make the point too I very rarely choose a sire um, based on what I see at a dog trial. 100%. And, and yeah, I think, you know, you're probably going to get an indication of what that dog has to offer. Um, you know, the, 14 if it's lucky enough on the day. That, that's right. But I think, yeah. I think if you're serious about selecting a sire, um, you're also going to take, obviously, into, you know, you're going to look at his pedigree. Um, but I think m more importantly, you know, if you can, go and have a look at him. Go go on farm, go and have a look at him. Um, and I Ribbons think... don't breed quality pups, do they? No, and that, that's right. So Give I think... Give indication of consistency, but they don't breed quality pups. That, 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 that's right. And um, so I think, yeah, more comes into the breeding aspect of it. Um, but, you know, trialling... And, and you look at, look, look at the guys that do trial and then look at the top sort of dogs that are being bred and whatnot, um, and, you know, and the, and the quality of those Kelpies. And I'd say that the, probably the majority of them are involved in trialling. Yep, answered that well. If anyone has seen me stir Laura when you mention 100 points, every time I get the chance, I remind that I got a 99 <laughs> once. But yeah. it didn't count, so I couldn't back it up in the final. So <laughs> <laughs> we finished on place anyway, so you get that on the big jobs. Uh, yeah, yes. actually answered a couple of other questions in uh, in that as well. Someone was um, really uh, liked your picture of Mackay Bediba in the background and asked about your interaction with horses, which you spoke about um, before you were speaking about Michael Johnson and um, how you started with horses before you got into dogs. Um, and you've touched on a few other uh, questions we have here as well. Um, and, yeah, no, you, and I really appreciate what you said there. That was, yeah, that was great, mate. You, I think a lot you would have answered the questions for a lot of people yeah. in that particular bit. No, no, that's all right. I guess just, just going on to the horses, um, uh, like I grew up in Sydney, um, no real interaction um, with with animals really. Um, my grandfather was a, a bloodstock agent with thoroughbreds and whatnot, and I've always had a you know a love for a love for animals. I think, and I I think I've. I've been fortunate enough to be given a, an ability to work with animals. Um, yeah. I certainly wasn't given the temperament to work with animals, especially when I was younger. And that was something that I had that, that I had to work on. Um, but yeah, look, the horses probably started um, started it off, um, and you know, I, I was um, breaking in horses for a, a, a racehorse um, enterprise. And um, that was my passion um, until I got into working dogs and slowly evolved, obviously, into more stock work and whatnot. And um, I think there are, you know, there are comparisons to make with, with horses and, 
and and dogs and I'm not so much sure on you know training other animals as such but you know horses I guess horses um, they live with a, a flight response and and you have to learn to you know you're you're educating and you're using that to your advantage to help train a horse and um, and I think I, I mentioned the other night when we were we were talking about I think working with horses it, it taught me to, to develop um, good timing and good feel and I think you can take that to a working dog I think if you can um, I think with a working dog if you've got good feel and good timing I think you can be a good handler yeah. Um, and so they're probably the comparisons, you know, that I'd make. Um, and, and I guess, yeah, as I said before, you know, um, I'd, I'd probably stop there when it, when it comes to taking the way that I was training horses sort of over into training dogs. I think it's, for me now, it's very two, um, you know, different things. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, my the question's actually flowing in pretty hard here. Um, <laughs> no, go ahead. A lot of our expense, uh, people have, um, no, go ahead. Expecting, um, what did you want to ask, Leon? Um, those of us learning, how can we work on our timing? Uh, I know that's a big thing for a lot of people, like still learning that the timing with our dogs, it's, it's something that, you know, when you first start out, it's that difficult sort of phase. How would you sort of... Can I make a suggestion with this one, Nate? So actually something that I observed recently with a couple of friends was timing. And I actually asked them to walk around and, and work the stock themselves before they put a dog on it to see the reaction yep. of the sheep. And we had some pretty runny um, sheep here, so it got a bit interesting. Um, but I, I think pennies dropped. And I went, oh, shit, that's what my dog's seen? Yep. How... Am I on track there? Do you think I'm off track? Um, look, I, there are probably better people to answer these sorts of things than me, but I'll give it a go. Um, I think I think some people are just born with timing. I think yeah. they're just they're just naturally born with with a gift. Um, but in saying that, it's something that can be developed. Um, I think. If you're fortunate enough to be in a position where you're, in, you know, you're handling a lot of dogs and um, I guess over the years, there's no doubt um, that through sheer numbers, you could improve, you know, your feel and your timing and your sense of reading stock and whatnot. I think one thing that makes it very difficult for beginners is that they don't understand and cannot read stock. Um, I think that's a big thing. And probably that getting out and getting around them yourselves and whatnot maybe gives you an appreciation from, you know, where you are creating a little bit of presence or pressure on the sheep and, and watching what reaction that you get. Um, you know, so I think... Yes, for some people, that's probably very beneficial. Um, and you've only got to you've only got to think. You know, when someone has uh, a bit of a you know a bad run at a trial, and you know the sheep either won't go into the first force or whatnot. And normally at the beginning of a trial, you know, we sort of get there, so the sheep don't think they've had a win. We try and get there and just sort of shape them up and sort of put them in. And you've only got to look at what it takes or four or five of us guys getting in there trying to chase the sheep and get in spots and you, you sort of see all sorts of different wacky manoeuvres. You know, who's got some that, cover and who doesn't? That's it. I think that gives you, an, you know, that really does give you an appreciation of, of, of the dog and, and what he's seeing and what he's doing at the time. And I think the best handlers, um, they, you know, they read stock to perfection and, you know, to the point that they know which sheep is going to offer the offer them that desired response, and they can work that dog to influence that sheep. I mean, that's yeah. to me that's bordering on masterful, you know. Um, and whether that's at a three sheep trial or whether it's in a yard trial, but you know, I remember recently at a Joe Spicer clinic, and one of the things that he even pointed out to me was, I don't watch my stock enough. Um, 
I'm focusing too much on the dog and I'm not focusing on my on my stock enough. And I think you tend to fall into that a little bit, especially when you're working a young dog, because you're so wrapped up in, you know, is this dog doing the right thing? Is he putting too much pressure on? Do I have to get out there and sort of manage him? Got to give him his head a bit. That's it. And 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 so, you know, I think that's probably one of the that's probably one of the biggest things coming into not not necessarily just trialing, but you know, is is your appreciation of how to read and how to work stock. And I think ultimately that you know that's going to come from if, if you can if you can get some on farm practical experience that is going to teach you more than anything that you're going to learn with three five or ten sheep in a little training round yard or whatnot so and sometimes you I think you've just got to you've got to suck it up you've got to throw your dog in the deep end and you've just got to put yourself out of your comfort zone and I think that's where you're going to do most of your most of your learning and I think most most of us um, have probably been in that situation and you know you know what it's like to have a few stragglers you know up the top of the hills and you don't have a dog that can you know it either can't cast there it's got no vision to even look there and whatnot um, you know, so I think things like that, they're practical learning experiences. And I think you you sort of bring that all together um, in terms of, you know, working your dog and, and eventually trialling and whatnot. But, um, yeah, I'd say definitely learn how to read stock. And then, in, and I think you were focusing initially on timing. I think timing just comes, you know, I, th I think that just comes through persistence it's getting educated by sort of good handlers and whatnot and and sort of putting yourself in you know you may even find yourself um sort of going through one or two dogs and maybe not doing the best job with them but then the penny drops you know with your next one or your next one and then and then you realize you know you know what it takes to get that you know that outcome that desired outcome so yeah um that's that's as deep as what I can go into into it really. You're pretty passionate about your dogs and learning from others and the people around you, aren't you? Yeah, look, I, I guess it's it probably consumes most of my life, to be honest. Um, I mean, first and foremost is probably my family. I mean, um, that they they mean the most to me, but after that, it's. I get up every day and I go to work and most of those days or a lot of those days involve, you know, working dogs and, um, you know, I, I don't want to get too deep into it, but my, my best friendships are through dogs. Um, you know, I guess my successes have come through dogs. You know, I, I feel I've got a, a really good job. That's come through the dogs. Um you know, I, I think one of the things that I probably get the most out of or I'm most passionate about is probably breeding dogs that suit people and go on to do a job and they get benefit out of it and they like it um, because I put, I, I really do try and put a lot of thought behind what I'm breeding and I guess first and foremost, I'm breeding for myself. I mean, that's just... That's just the way it is. Um, but to have other people come to you because they find that those dogs also suit them and, um, you know, that's that's really rewarding. Um, that makes it worthwhile. And um, I actually get more out of watching people at trials, trialling dogs that I've bred than actually getting out there myself and doing it. So, um, yeah, so, look, I am passionate about it, but it really means a lot to me. And I think that's probably the reason why I threw my hat in for the president's role, because I want to try and bring that passion to the association. And I think we've got, you know, I think there are so many different avenues we can take to, I'm not suggesting anything's broken and that we've got to fix anything, but I think we can just take it to new heights. And I'd like to sort of see it. Um, sort of reach new heights and uh, if I can be 
you know, involved in that, um, well, you know, that, that would really mean a lot. So um, I certainly didn't do it because I've got the time to do it. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, look, it's just it's one of those things that, um, you know, I felt like I just wanted to, you know, give my all to and, um, yeah, and, and we'll just see what, you know, what the outcome might be. Oh, very cool. You, you mentioned time there, mate. Um, the rumours of you turning up at uh, brunch time from few the boys there, um, that's not true, is it? No, no, no. I'm, I'm up and out there before everyone else. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So he tells us now. <laughs> I can witness that first hand. That's, that's all right. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> mate, um, where do you believe um, is Dog Talk's spot in our community? Like, where, where can we help our members? Look, I think... Well, well, there's no other website that caters for what you're planning to cater for. Um, yes, there's social media and other, um, you know, other social media platforms, probably Facebook um, and to a lesser extent some of the other ones. But um, I think I think through Facebook, uh, look, there are there are a whole heap of different working dog discussion groups and and whatnot and um look i think uh, look sometimes there are good you know there are good conversations made through facebook and whatnot um i think that you know it can tend to get very personal on facebook and i think you can draw in people that maybe aren't necessarily as passionate about dogs as others and I think maybe what dog talk has to offer is you're going to bring people that are genuinely passionate about what it is that they do and perhaps what they're seeking and they're going to go to the effort to log in you know become a member and participate and um, and look that's not to say that you, you know you might not get outsiders in doing it, but perhaps more, you know, hopefully people have the respect of one another and their opinions, um, a little bit more of a controlled environment, um, respect for you guys and what you're trying to do, you know, to bring sort of constructive discussion. Um, because I think, you know, for me, too often, you know, on some of these other ones, there's too much tearing down. Um, and I think this is probably a place that you can, you know, build others up and, uh, you know, put educational product on there that someone might want to see how they can more effectively get a pup to start balancing up. So you might have a David Motley video on there that perfectly shows how they can then get in there and start balancing a pup up. Or, you know, how do I get my dog, you know, barking on command and so maybe ben costa puts up a video and you know he's he's set up a dog you know in a in a position that you know helps him get them to speak on command and backing and whatnot and i think if it can become more of an educational tool and somewhere where we can sort of learn off one another that's probably where the unique side of it is um <laughs> And that's exactly what we want it to be. Like um, our biggest fear is with all, like with that is social media can shut things down so quickly um, that that information is lost. And our idea is that we get to store it for future generations. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, look, you can see, I mean, we have no control of how social media works. I mean, they can drop you, um, you know, in an instant. Um, and I think... You know, that's that's I think just the 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 brainstorm idea that you guys have had um, to put something like this together. You know, you you have to be commended for that because um, you know I can understand it probably hasn't been easy and it comes at a, at, at an expense and whatnot. And um, you know, but if there's anything that we probably know about the dog community is we like to support. Um, you know, others, and I think for those reasons you'll find that, you know, you'll get a lot of support and, 
you know, I, I, I hope for your sake and for everyone's that this just builds and builds into something, you know, greater than hopefully what you anticipate. Well, when you started there, I was like, geez, we should have got you to write our mission statement. <laughs> <laughs> for a very, yeah, mission statement than us. So I was pretty impressed with that. So, no, and thanks, mate. Um, what you said, you know, we were concerned at times of the criticism we might pat, like cop, and, you know, we probably ummed and ahed a bit until we got a pretty good kick up the backside to do something with our time. Yep. Um, so, um, no, it's, you know, hearing things like that and the support that we actually have received from the working dog community that, you know, like I, I think they have seen our vision and, and what we want to do and, you know, we just want to preserve it and, you know, just do the best we can and let everyone remember, like, try and be the best person you can while you're out there. You know, you mentioned about people copping floggings on social media. There's no need for it. So hopefully by going to the effort of logging into our website, it keeps a lot of those people that aren't fair income and just want to tear others down out of what we do. Yeah, no, look, at um you know, I, I think that's one thing about, uh, you know, when you turn up to trials and, and you know, as, as a whole, you, um, you've you just got a great group of people that genuinely get along with one another. And um, that's one of the draw cards of it. And um, I know that, you know, I, I know that there are many um, in the association that, you know, that are going to back you 100%. So... Fingers crossed, mate. <laughs> and, and no, thank you. And and not just this association either. Like I know tonight we obviously we're talking about yard trialing and kelpies and whatnot. But you know, like one of my passions is three sheep trialing. Um, you know, I want to go out there and do the best I can with the kelpie. And we want to encourage kelpie, collie, three sheepers, utility trialers. This, this page is for everybody. It's not for kelpie loving th yard trialers. It's it's for everyone. So. I suppose that's one message that we really want to get out there as well. So, you know, and, yep. and if any any time people, someone thinks that we're going down that direction, flick us a note. Like, we can't fix something that we don't know is broken. Mm. So, yep. or what we may perceive is broken. So, don't be afraid to speak up because that, that's not. We, we don't want to go down a particular direction. We're, we're open to everything. So, what else we got there, Laura? Um, if there was one person you'd like to see us sit down and do a Q and A with. Who would you like that to be? Oh, putting us spot here. <laughs> uh, look, that's a hard one. I'd have to say Chris Stapleton. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that may be a challenge, <laughs> but if you can pull it off, um, you might crash the uh, Dog Talk Network. So, um, <laughs> yeah, any 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 chance any chance to. Um, yeah, to, to tap into Chris and his experiences and his and his knowledge and whatnot. Um, yeah, I'd I'd have to and and I, and I guess the reason I answer that too is, um, you know, I don't know Chris, you know, particularly well, and he's probably someone that I, I would like to sort of just see, um, sort of sit down and and just have a chat about those sorts of things. So yeah, I'd have to say Chris. Yeah. You just you just set me a challenge there, mate. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it on the list. So, yeah, good job. Um, Chris, you're probably not listening tonight, mate, but um, I know where Barragher is, so <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> we'll try and get out there. Uh, what else? Do you want to pick up something else from on here? Um, we have a question here from Tracy Huxtable. Um, would you rate a good dog would you rate a dog good or bad if it would never make it to a trial but is a good worker? Can you yeah, okay. this one, Nathan, and get your opinion on it? Yeah. I, I personally don't think there's such thing as a bad dog. I think there's different dogs in a way that they either work for us or don't. I don't know that, that answers Tracy's um, question, but that, that's – and I've probably changed a lot in the way I personally handle a dog over the last six months. Um, well, you, you've seen it firsthand. I've, I've changed a lot in the last yep. six months of the way I do it. And so I, I personally don't believe there are – Good and bad dogs. I believe it's that they either work with us, or we, of more so, we work with them, um, and they suit us, or they don't. But how do you see that? Yeah. Look, I'll just um, just brief, very briefly, before I go on to that. Um, Trace is actually in the UK, um, and look, she's um, she she in herself is 
actually a wealth of knowledge in terms of, of Kelpies and pedigrees and and breeding over there. And um, I, I was fortunate enough, you know, Tracy invited me to go over to the UK um, and, you know, with her. And um, again, that, that's just another thing that, you know, is, you know, the dogs and, and whatnot sort of took me overseas and, and I've, you know, probably got a really great friendship with Tracy um, and, you know, she's she's just a, as passionate as I am about um, about dogs. So to know that she's logged in tonight and she's listening, you know, I'll say a quick hello to Tracy and I'm glad she's listening from over in the UK. And, yeah, Tracy. Um, but, yeah, look, just to so basically to answer her question, um, absolutely there are dogs out there that don't suit uh, trialling that, you know, are probably very, very good work dogs. Um, I guess from a personal perspective, I like trialling and I only like to keep a limited amount of dogs. So I probably wouldn't. Um, I would probably want that dog to be able to do both. Um, but I get. I think where I think a lot of us are getting to the stage now through, you know, the different clinics, which I think are really important, and I I would love to see more of them. Um, but I think we're getting to the stage now where we can take dogs that probably don't possess a lot naturally, and we can shape them and sort of mould them into getting to the trial arena and you know being being successful um so yeah do i believe though that there's a difference between good dogs and bad dogs i've seen some pretty ordinary dogs um yeah whether you know whether that could be changed by you know their foundation or a little bit of better handling and training and whatnot perhaps um but i think yeah dan look you probably you know you probably pointed it out you know you've changed yourself yeah. and i think that's one thing that when we're training dogs and things aren't working for us um i think a lot of us probably tend to Try you know, we look to make excuses and we and and we take it you know it's it's incredible how many people take it personally when their dogs are doing the wrong thing like as if the dog's got this vendetta against you <laughs> that he is just going to he's going to do the wrong thing he's just going to make your day as as hard as possible so that you've got to scream and yell at him you know for eight to ten hours <laughs> uh, but I think very rarely if ever you know, you know, the dog, if he's not doing the right thing, um, that's probably time for self-analyzing and go back to your foundation or, um, you know, maybe you need to tweak a few things. I think that's probably where it comes back to um, more than anything. But, um, yeah. I'd probably focus more on that. I think that the point that you made, Dan, that, you know, you changed yourself um, has probably made more of a difference than anything else. So, um, you know, and kudos to those handlers that can take those ordinary dogs and, and turn them into, you know, the extraordinary dogs that, you know, sort of were control successfully and whatnot because it takes a lot of dedication. It takes a lot of time um you know to get to that point so you know and there's many many guys out there that you know that can do that so um you know all respect to them no fantastic no you into that great way we'd just like to thank all of our members um for tuning in tonight we've actually had over 60 to 70 there at one stage um, and that's yeah been really positive for our first Q and A. So hopefully we can only go upwards from there with this. And we apologise for any questions we didn't get to either. They've um, like, been coming in like coming, okay. been flowing in, and like we could be here till midnight. <laughs> I'm happy to do that if everyone else is. Um, everyone knows I don't need an excuse to talk. So um, yeah, we'd like to thank our listeners and. Um, 
and especially you, Nathan, for jumping on and putting yourself out there in front of everyone too. No, all all, uh, all good uh, to a good cause. And I, I really do wish you all the best, um, not only, and congratulations with the magazine too. I think that's awesome. Yeah. So, <laughs> thanks, so, you know, collect, collectively, I, yeah, I wish you all the best for the magazine. I wish you all the best for the website. And I, I have, I've really enjoyed um, uh, coming on tonight. And I hope that uh, you just get more support from others that are, willing to come on and uh, I know I'll be logging in, um, you know, to, to, to watch it. So, yeah, yeah thanks, thanks for having me. You. you haven't got away that easy. I have one more question. Um, uh, yeah. would, you, would you rather fight 20 ducks, the si 20 horses the size of ducks or one duck the size of a horse? Got <laughs> <laughs> uh, him. So 20 horses the size of ducks? Yep, or one duck, one duck the, the size, size of a horse? Uh, <laughs> yeah, look, you've stumped me there. I'd have to say I'd choose the duck the size of a horse. Why? I hope there's no. Uh, I hope there's no other angle on this because I'm certainly. <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> I, this I, I, I'm not getting it, but. Look, uh, having had experience with horses, um, you know, even 20 horses the size of ducks um, at shin level. I'd still I, can, I, I, can, I can imagine what that would be like. Um, <laughs> look, a duck at a horse level, I, I'd probably, I'd probably take my chances more with the duck at the horse level. <laughs> yeah, it's a very well. I still haven't made a decision, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 um, thank you very much for your time tonight, mate. Um, we really much, we really appreciate it. Uh, we hope all our listeners out there can take something away from this. Open to suggestions anytime. If anything else, so we've got a side note coming here. Um, this yep. will be recorded for people to watch um, later on as well. Um, that'll be in the same live Q and A tab. Q &A. <laughs> yep, very good. And please yeah. remember that we learn every day and the day we stop learning from each other will be a very sad day. Absolutely. I'm with you there, mate. Fantastic, mate. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Have a good time. night. All good. Okay, see ya. Bye. Cheers, mate.